use them today. They were just ornamented. And uh, often, uh, people couldn't afford the buttons. And so, if you had a button, it showed that you had wealth. And if you wore more than one button, it really showed your wealth. And so, uh, they didn't have buttons in rows uh, in the early years. Uh, they just kind of had them stuck on, kind of at, like jewelry. And uh, the more buttons, the wealthier the, the person was. There, there were no reinforced buttonholes until the mid-13th century. Now, that seems like a long time ago, but, you know, that's only like 800 years in comparison to 5,000. That's not really all that long ago. And again, they did not have the reinforced button holes like we have, but just kind of uh, with loops. And uh, they, they were not, buttons were not in a straight row until the Industrial Revolution because it was easier to make machines to create buttons and buttonholes in a straight line. And so they uh, began to uh, create the clothing with machinery. And so they lined them up buttonhole and button uh, because of that. And then also I did a little bit of research into shirts, and shirts were worn only as undergarments or nightwear. Think of uh, Ebenezer, Ebenezer Scrooge, you know, the, the long night shirt that, uh, that he was portrayed in. That's the only use. That it was not an outer garment. They would just wear the shirt under a, a jacket, and a jacket would usually be buttoned up pretty much uh, to the neck. Um, and the modern shirt that, that we are used to, kind of what uh, we would look at now as a dress shirt, the modern shirt went under ma major transformation at the end of World War I, which is only 100 years ago. The Industrial Revolution was about 200 years ago, so the buttons got lined up in, uh, 200 years ago, but then the, the idea of the whole open shirt with just attached by buttons uh, began around World War I, and then around World War II, again, they, is when they became popular. So that may be 50, 60 years ago that, um, that shirts like we wear uh, happened now. And I just decided this morning, you folks are so gracious, I, I thought, sure, I'd get comments. Nobody mentioned about the way my shirt is buttoned this morning. And, uh, you know, you didn't say it to me. You were probably back there whispering, Goss God doesn't like gossip, folks. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm teasing. Uh, I didn't get anywhere close to my wife so she would see me or she would have made me uh, fix this up. Um, but, uh, you know, I just decided I'm not going to let some 200-year-old machine dictate how I dress. And I'm not going to just let some fa fashionista tell me how I should dress. You know, why do I have to have my buttons buttoned a certain way just because some movie star may have worn it on a red carpet one year or something and they decided that that should, should be style. You know, that's kind of how styles come along. Uh, if if an actress wears a short skirt, then all of a sudden short skirts are in style. The next year, if one wears a long dress, then that's what's in style and, and all of those kinds of things. And so I'm, I'm just going to be a little bit rebellious this morning. I, I didn't line them up, and I have a, one that's not even buttoned at all, just kind of hanging out there. I'm not going to conform to some industrial revolution machine. Now, if you're here for the first Sunday this morning, you think, this man is nuts. And those of you who have been here more than once know that's true. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not talking about buttons this morning. That's not really what I'm talking about. You know, when Jesus was on the earth, he spoke in parables. And when he talked about his seed, he wasn't talking about a seed. And when he talked about soil, he really didn't mean the soil. And when he told the, the uh, disciples to watch the fig tree, he wasn't concerned about figs and trees. He had a spiritual message in what he was saying. And, and I want to remind us this morning that there are just a lot of people who live their lives like I have buttoned my shirt this morning. There's just no rhyme or reason. It doesn't fit. It, does, it isn't right. It just, it, you know, the hem, all of a sudden on my shirt doesn't match up anymore. Um, and, and so there, there's just, you know, a whole lot of other information. I could tell you where shirts come from. I could tell you why women's blouses or shirts 
button on the, wrong, uh, the other side, almost to the wrong side, woo. Uh, <laughs> and why some have you know, buttons down the back, I've, I, invest, I, I understand all that now. I investigated all those things. But uh, I'm not talking about buttons. I'm talking about how people live their lives. And I believe that we can see in, in our scripture today, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 34, how we can get this mess that I'm in straightened out. And hopefully you'll be able to see how, even though you may have dressed more decently than I have this morning, how you can get the mess in your life straightened out. We want to talk about no worry investments. Brian Hathaway points out that 16 times in the New Testament that that the New Testament refers to Jesus as Savior. 16 times Jesus is called Savior in the New Testament. But 420 times the New Testament refers to him as Lord. You know, we, we, we spend a lot of time and effort, and we should, trying to get people to receive Jesus as their Savior. But many more times in, in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as Lord. And there's a difference between having Jesus as your Savior and Jesus as your Lord. That word Lord means master or, or, or model, the one that, that you look to. At long ago, 30, 40 years ago, John Maxwell put out a stewardship um, material uh, sermon series titled, Stewardship is Lordship. And what he means by that is that the way that you relate to things, material things, shows who is the Lord of your life, who's in control, who's your master. And this is the, what the, the scripture is about this morning. Jesus is uh, speaking the greatest sermon. That's the, the, uh, the, the theme for our sermon series, The Greatest Sermon. It's the sermon that Jesus spoke right at the very beginning of his ministry. He had been baptized, and then he went out and uh, began to heal people, and large crowds were gathering, and he went out on a hillside and began to preach. And we have in Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7 the, the sermon, and we've noticed a number of things from this, but today we want to see how it relates to material things and to priorities. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, is the key verse for this whole section. Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot... Jesus said you shouldn't, or didn't say you shouldn't. He said you cannot serve both God and money. You have to make up your mind. Now, the Greek word, the, the Greek language is, is the language that the Bible was originally, the New Testament was originally written in. And uh, that Greek word that is translated in the NIV as money is actually the phrase mammon, which means in the Hebrew, that in which one trusts. It's where we get our security. It's where we place our security. Where we think that, you know, this is, this is where we can be secure. It's that which one can find security. It's where, the one in which you trust. And you cannot trust both God and material resources. You either trust God or you trust material. And we live in a materialistic society and it's ingrained in us to trust material things. And so Jesus is being very cross, uh, countercultural both in his time and in our time today as he says that we cannot trust both God and money. And so I'm, in this passage of scripture I see three cures for the dysfunctions of the sinful nature. You see, our sinful nature that we are born with, we are born in sin because Adam and Eve sinned. The sinful nature is in every person who is born into the world. And our sin nature wants to have security, wants to have control, wants to know what's going to happen next, 
We don't like to think of next year and not know what's going to happen or 10 years down the road. And a lot of people are fearful for their children and fearful for their grandchildren and what's going to happen in this election and what's going to happen to the economy and what's going to happen with uh, all the, the terrorism that's taking place. And all these different things uh, people, are, people are afraid of. Where is our security? We don't, we don't like to be without security. And uh, so we want to look at, at these cures for dysfunctions that are part of our sinful nature. The, the first cure is, not, is, is an investment. All of these are investments. The first one is invest in generosity instead of materialism. Invest in generosity instead of materialism. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 23, Jesus is speaking. He said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness. And, and as we look at this, Jesus here is not criticizing all savings. He's not saying that you should never save. He's pointing out that you cannot place your confidence or your security on earthly possessions that you stored up. You know, sometimes people will, you know, and, and rightfully so, so, save for retirement, have a pension plan, uh, maybe not so much confidence in Social Security anymore, but thinking, well, that's going to be coming, and all of those kinds of things, and, and they like to have their security. But, you know, it's amazing. I, I don't, don't know how some people have done it that have been retired 20, 30 years. When they were working, the economy was such that uh, the income was much lower than what it is today, and you're living on what you saved 30 years ago and trying to live on it today, and, and you know, the the, the prices and everything is so much different. And then you have the fluctuations in the economy and sometimes what you invested in, the bottom drops out of the stock market and your investment isn't there anymore and all of those kinds of things. And, and Jesus is warning us. He's saying, don't put your security, don't put uh, your trust in material things. Uh, don't just think, well, I have this much money in the bank and I have this much money in my pension and the government's going to give me this much because I paid in Social Security all my life and all of those things. He says, he says there's two problems with material things. The first are the natural processes of decay and rest. What once was valuable no longer is valuable. That there was a time when someone who had a job and he got paid or she got paid $10 an hour, that was a great, great wage. And now today, they want to give $15 as a minimum wage to flip burgers and fry french fries. Which, that's another story. We won't get into all that. But anyway, the process of decay. Things don't hold their value in this world. And then also human greed. Thieves break in and steal. It wasn't too many years ago where all these uh, uh, crises were coming about because we were finding out that the people that we were trusting at the very highest levels in banking and investment were, were, were nothing but thieves. Uh, they, they were greedy. And, and, and they had all these scams that were set up that was filling their pockets. And some of them ended up going to prison because of the scams that, that they were running. And, and we were trusting them with the American economy and with our investments. And, and they were... Uh, uh, not trustworthy. And so, you know, we think of thieves that break in and steal as a, as a bank robber, but sometimes they're the bankers. Uh, that, and, uh, and, you know, the other week I made a comment about lawyers, and now I've offended all the bankers. There's good, there's good lawyers and they're good bankers, okay? But, uh, you know, there, those are things that uh, sometimes the greed is able to come through. But the Bible does direct us to the ant who puts aside food for the winner. And so the Bible is not teaching us, and Jesus is not teaching us that it's somehow it's wrong to save. He's just saying, don't put your confidence there. In, in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, 
I remember when my sons memorized this in Christian school when they were in either kindergarten or the first grade. It says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider his, its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in winter and gathers its, harvest, its food at harvest. And then in Proverbs 30, verse 25, Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the winter. And so, as the Bible encourages us to, to be wise with our money. Joseph, in, in the uh, story in Genesis, when Egypt was going to face famine, he was wise enough to tell them to store up the, the grain so that in the lean years that were coming, that they would have what is needed uh, to have that. So don't, don't confuse and misunderstand what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying that you shouldn't have something saved, but don't put your confidence in it. Five years from now, 10 years from now, 20, 30 years from now, it may not be there. And what you thought was secure, what you thought would get you through may not be what you thought it would be. And I'm not trying to put fear in your mind. I'm just trying to teach you what Jesus is telling us about materials. Jesus points us to a better place to store up our treasures. Store up your treasures in heaven. And then he goes on and he begins to talk about something that to us as English-speaking people makes no sense. It's like he changed the subject. He went off the highway somewhere and he got lost. But Jesus was staying right on, on target when he was talking about eyesight. He, he goes right into this thing if you have good eyesight and if you have bad eyesight. Well, in those days, they did not understand that, uh, that the eyes are the gateway for light to come in to your body so that you can see. They looked at the eyes being like a lamp and it revealed what was inside of you. And when someone was referred to as having good eyes, it meant that they were generous. And someone who had bad eyes was a stingy person. They were always looking what they could get and keep for themselves. Where with good eyes, they were always looking for ways to be able to share and to help other people. I, I read uh, just uh, the other day about a person who had gone to a wedding. And um, they received a card after the wedding from the couple that had gotten married. And the card said, I, I'm sure that, um, that the gift that you gave was a mistake. But they, they had, the, the couple, bride and groom, had asked for monetary gifts. They didn't, they didn't want uh, other gifts. They just wanted money. And uh, this person had written a, a check for $100. And uh, they wrote back and said, uh, in your position, you should be able to do a whole lot more than that. And so if you want to send more, we would gladly receive uh, what you would have. And uh, the person that received that card had, had just recently had a, an inheritance. And so that's why they thought that, that that person should be able to do better. And was trying to think how to respond to such a selfish, a greedy kind of greeting from a new bride and groom. And uh, the person remembered, oh, I had taken a picture of the gift table. And there was a card there that said, thank you, but your presence is really our gift, you know, being at the wedding. And so that person uh, took a, that picture and sent it back to them with a note that said, apparently, this was a mistake, referring to, to the card that was on the table. You know, greed is not only a one-way street. Greed is, is not only uh, that, that we want what we don't have, but how, appreciatively, how appreciative are we of what we already have? You know, God has given us so much. And yet we are taught, it's almost ingrained as we want more, we want better, we want bigger, we want newer, we want improved. Everything's got to be better than what it was. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, when can we just say, thank you God for what you've given to me? And to be able to share with others with generosity. Generosity reflects the content of, of the heart. A person with good eyes is a generous person because they have a generous heart. And this is what Jesus is pointing to. We can lay up treasures in heaven by being generous. And Jesus calls us to be generous because the true source of security is not in human wealth, in material wealth, but it is in God. 
The second thing that Jesus tells us that will help us to overcome these dysfunctions of our sinful nature is to invest in prayer instead of worry. Invest in prayer instead of worry. Jesus lists a few things that tend to make us worry and which we focus our energy on. What we will eat, what we will drink, and what we will wear. If Jesus was talking to a crowd of people today, he'd add where you live and what you drive to, to that list. These are things that we invest our lives in. Uh, we worry about those things. We focus our energy on being able to provide those things. And, and Jesus is saying we should not worry. In, in Matthew 6, 31 and 32, he says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. In talking about the spread of the gospel, I, uh, there was um, an article that I read, and the writer wrote this paragraph. He said, think about it. The gospel is spreading around the world today despite civil wars, Islamic terrorism, left-wing conspiracies, right-wing conspiracies, and evil tyrants. That's because regardless of who is in power at any given moment, our God is on His throne in heaven. We can rest on His sovereignty. And, and so many Christians today are just worried about who's going to govern us and how we're going to be governed and how it's going to affect our, uh, our country and our nation. And, and I think of places like Cuba where the Jesus film is being taken and people are coming to Christ and they're, they're reaching just over the last year or two, Pastor uh, uh, Junio Gonzalez, who was here at our church about a year ago, uh, he's seen out of his one local congregation 15 churches that have been planted. And out of those others, up to 22 churches. And now they're heading toward the east from, from where the Wesleyan churches are located and taking the Jesus film and planting more churches. And in Uganda, that has been under the, the rule of, of dictators and, and people who, who have been harsh and, and selfish and let the people live in poverty while they were in wealth. And again, the Jesus film is being taken there and people are being saved by the hundreds and churches are being started and they need more leaders and, and trained pastors to go and to lead them. And we need to remember that God is in control and He can take care of us. We don't need to worry. We need to pray. We need to trust God. Don't trust the government. Don't trust your money. Don't trust these other things. Don't worry about where these things are coming from. Trust in God. In Psalm 115 verse 3 it says, Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases Him. When things don't go the way we think they should, we can go to sleep at night and leave our concerns in His hands. Like someone said, God's going to be all, up all night anyway. Just let Him take care of it, rather than us laying awake all night worrying about it. We can trust that He is at work even when it seems His enemies are, worry, are winning. We worry when we don't trust God. You say, well, I'm just the kind of person that worries. Well, then you're that kind of person that doesn't trust God. When we trust God, we don't have to worry. Now, we may be concerned. There may be some anxiety. There's a lot of things about the future we, we may not be sure about. Of course, there's going to be some anxiety. But we trust in God. He's in control. In Isaiah 40, verse 23, it says, He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. His sovereign plan will be accomplished in His time. And no man, woman, or army can stop Him. All of the evil people of the world, all the evil leaders of government can get together and put their plans together, but they will accomplish nothing unless God says that it's to be. He is in control. He is the one who is sovereign. In Lamentations chapter 5, verse 19, it says, You, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. 
from the time of Adam until today. There have been many problems. There have been many things, wars and, and, and devastation that has taken place. Even his son was nailed to a cross, but God has handled it all. And from generation to generation, as we come to this time, He can handle what we're facing today. He can handle what our children will face. He can handle what our grandchildren will face. He is in control. He is sovereign and He's over all things. We don't need to worry. We need to pray. Don't invest in worry. Matter of fact, in this passage of Scripture, Jesus uses many different examples of how worry can avail nothing. Worry, you can't do anything Worry doesn't help you at all. It doesn't add to your life. If anything, it shortens your life. God sees the beginning from the end. And his perspective is not limited like ours. He is God and we are not. God is eternal. And human history is but like a dot on eternity. God sees everything. He already knows how this is going to turn out. He already knows what's going to happen in your life and in mine. Worrying does not help, but prayer does. It's the key of moving the hand of God. And then the third thing that we want to notice is to invest in eternal things instead of the temporary. Invest in the eternal instead of the temporary. Now, Just prior to this, Jesus had given the disciples the Lord's Prayer. We talked about that last Sunday. Jesus had just taught us to pray to our Heavenly Father. He knows our needs. And He has the power to meet our needs. And and Jesus said, take it to the Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Invest in the eternal things. Invest in the kingdom of God, not in the earthly things. And not only does God know our needs, but he has the power to meet our needs. Many times people will come to me as a pastor and they'll tell me what their needs are. And many times they're physical or sometimes they're, they're uh, uh, financial or maybe relational or whatever they may be. And other than trying to give a word of encouragement or maybe sometimes I can give a little bit of, of, of advice uh, from, from my own experience, but really I don't have the ability to solve your problems. But God does. And I'm not saying don't tell me or don't tell other people what you're facing. That's fine. But be sure to tell God. Because all of us together in this room can't solve your problem. But God can. He has the power to meet your need. Jesus said in, in Matthew 6, and 34, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for worry will, excuse me, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You see, worrying is not going to fix tomorrow. All that worry will do is ruin today. When tomorrow comes, it's going to have its own burdens. It's going to have its own struggles. It's going to have its own trials. And today has its own burdens and its own struggles and its own trials. And when you worry, you're taking tomorrow's burdens and you're adding them on top of today's burdens. What we need to do is face each day with the confidence that God can meet our needs, give us this day our daily bread. God can take care of today, and when tomorrow comes, he'll still be God. He'll still be on the throne. He'll still be sovereign, and he can take care of your your needs tomorrow just as he has today. In the light of the Lord's Prayer that he had taught us earlier, we are to pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done. The reason that we worry is because we're concerned about us and ours and the material things that we have. But Jesus taught us to pray before we ever get to our needs, we should be praying for his kingdom and for his righteousness. And he says, and then all of these other things will be added 
unto you. Just like my shirt this morning, you will never get your life right until you begin by getting the lordship issue right in your life. Who is in control of your life? Who is the master of your life? You or Jesus? Whose kingdom are you building? Yours or God's? Whose will do you most want to have accomplished on earth? God's will or your will? It's after addressing God, it's the very first thing that Jesus said. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus said if we pray, if we make him the priority, if we seek him first, all these other things will be added to you. Now, this is just a simple illustration. You probably taught your children this. Okay? By the way, build your kingdom here. That's, uh, that's the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and also, before somebody comes to the door and says, you, this isn't your top button, I picked a shirt that doesn't have buttons above where I normally button them. So this is the top button. But if you get the top button correct, everything else falls in line. You see? If you put Jesus where he belongs, where I had Jesus before, I had it, I had it crooked, Jesus was hanging out up here. The Lord, you know, he was, and that's the way a lot of Christians live their lives. Oh, I know, I asked Jesus to be my Savior. I prayed the prayer and I handed in the card and now I live my life the way I want to. No, Jesus needs to have first place. He needs to be in charge. He has to be in control. We don't live the way we want to. We need to dig into Scripture. We need to get in small groups. We need to be around Christians and learn how to live the Christian life so that Jesus is in the right place. And then when He is in the right place, then our family begins to come together. And we have a clear understanding of our education and, and what we need to do, and our career, our, our calling. You know, what we, what we do, and even Christians, we do this, and I, you know, I do that. You see a child, and you say, what do you want to do, or what do you want to be when you grow up? And somebody's going to college, and you say, what's your major? What, you know, what are your goals? What, what do you want to do with your degree? We should be asking a whole different question for ourselves, and for others, what is God calling you to be? What is God calling you to do? Why did God create you? The, the gifts and the talents that you have and, and your interests, what do you see in yourself? What is your understanding of what God wants you to be and to do? God calls us not just to be preachers and missionaries, but God calls people in many different facets of life. What do you believe God wants you to do? And that would be a wonderful question for little kids so that they begin to think that way. When they're four or five and six, instead of saying, what do you want? They hear, what do you want? All the way till they're 20, and they think that's supposed to be how they pick what they're going to do, what they want. But what if the, the church of Jesus Christ, we began to say to children, what's God calling you to do? What, what do you think God wants you to do with your life? And then as, as that goes, the, the, the calling and career, and, and you have your finances, and you begin to tithe, which is a sign of lordship. Uh, stewardship is lordship. Getting your finances right. Your finances will not be right until you put Jesus as lord of your life and put him over your finances. And tithing is the first place to begin. This isn't a tithing service or sermon, but it fits there, so I'm going to share it. And then your time and talent. How do you use your time? And, and, your, and your talent. There's nothing wrong with having a hobby. There's nothing wrong with doing things that you enjoy. But where is God in all of this? How do you use your time, the, the abilities that God has given to you? How are you using that to advance the kingdom of God? And you can applaud now. I actually got my shirt button the right way. And that, that's pretty amazing for me. All, all in once preaching and buttoning my shirt at the same time. That's, uh, I usually can't do all of that at once. But you understand what I'm trying to say. Now, it doesn't come automatic. 
You still have to work at it. You still have to work at your relationships and work at your job and, and you know, try to get everything uh, in, in order. I'm not saying it just falls together automatically, but once you have the lordship issue settled, Jesus said, and all these other things will be added to you. When you know who's in charge, when you know who the master is, when you know who the Lord is, and you live your life as if Jesus is your master, he's your Lord, he begins to help you with your family. He begins to help you with your education. He begins to help you with your career. He begins to help you with your finances. He begins to help you with your time and your talent. And all of these things come together. But it's only after we put Jesus first. You know, there's a lot of even Christians today who simply don't want to follow what God's Word says. They say, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to live my life the way some preacher tells me to live. Don't be thumping that Bible at me. Uh, I'm not going to live my life by some book that was written centuries and even millennia ago. You know, it's a nice thing that Jesus forgave my sins and I want to go to heaven, but I'm not going to live by what the Bible says. When I first came here to be pastor, some of you probably are tired of hearing me say this, but this never happened to me in my whole life before. I had a person when I first came here said, why do you preach so much out of the Bible? Why don't you just make something up so it's interesting? If that's all the church means to us, we might as well stay home. If, if all you want to do is be entertained, there are a lot of people that are a whole lot better at it than what we are. We're just amateurs. I'm trying to share the word of God with you. You see, and we need to begin to live our lives as if Jesus Christ is really Lord. And so if you've been a Christian for a little while or a long while, or if you haven't yet found him yet, what you need to do is to begin to learn how to live the way Jesus wants you to live. Seek him first and his righteousness and all these other things will be added. They will begin to fall into place once we've settled the lordship issue. The first step is to make Jesus Lord, to allow him to be your savior and begin by making him your savior, then make him the Lord or the master of your life. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And so this morning, as I conclude, there are two different groups of people I want to talk to. There are believers here this morning who say, I know that I'm a Christian, but my life is still messed up. I, I, I still live with a lot of dysfunctions in my life. Things don't fit together. It's just not making sense. It's just not working. Do you have Jesus where he belongs? Is he in first place? Or is he just hanging out here all week long and then when you show up at church, oh yes, I love Jesus, but is he really Lord of your life? on a daily basis. That's where we need to begin. And when we put him there, when we put him first, all these other things are at it. He doesn't take them away. He gives them to us when we put him where he belongs in our lives. And perhaps there's someone here that would say, I don't even have Jesus in my life. I've never even asked him to forgive my sins and be my savior. I've never decided to follow Jesus. I would encourage you this morning to pray a prayer with me that I'll be praying in a moment in, in my closing prayer. I would like for you to do that. Now, I don't ask public indications from new believers, people that are just coming to Christ. But I wonder this morning if those who would say, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life this morning. I have been living my life for myself. I've been pursuing material things. I've been putting my trust in material things. I've been worrying. I, I've been doing all these things that Jesus tells me I'm not supposed to do. That's what I've been doing as a Christian. And you'd like to stand up and say, I know that Jesus needs to be the Lord of my life, the master of my life. Are there Christians today who would just stand and say, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life? Would you stand?
Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. You're our creator. Just like the shirt I'm wearing was made to be worn in a certain way, you made us to live a certain way. And your design is that Jesus Christ should be Lord of our lives, that he should be master not just for an hour on Sunday morning, but every day that we live, every choice that we make, everything that we do. Now, we wouldn't have to worry about the outcomes because we trust in Jesus as our Lord. Lord, I pray for these who are standing right now. I thank you for the courage that they've had to to stand up in the midst of this congregation. But Lord, if we can't stand up in church where we're all on the same team pulling together, how will we ever stand up in the world? And so I thank you for these who are standing, and I pray, Lord, that you would help them to live what they are declaring this morning, that they would put their total trust in you, not only for salvation, but for their daily living, that they would trust you with every aspect of of their lives, that you would be Lord. And then, Lord, I pray for any among us this morning who may not have ever asked you to forgive their sin and be their Savior. They've never chosen to follow you. I pray that you would help them to pray this prayer in their heart and to mean it from the depth of their heart. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I was born in sin. And I have committed acts of sin. And I confess to you that I'm a sinner and I confess my sin. But this morning, I repent. I turn around. I change my mind. I change my direction. I turn from my sin and I turn from you. And today I ask you to be my Savior, to forgive my sin. And Lord, I ask you to help me to follow you all the days of my life. Lord, I pray that you would answer these prayers both for Christians who want you to be Lord of their life, as well as those who have come to Christ today asking for forgiveness of sin and to begin to follow you. Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church family to be the witnesses that you would have us to be, and that as we live under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that we would have a confidence that's noticed in the world, not pride, not arrogance, but a confidence that you're in control. And Lord, that you would help each of us to trust in you more than what we trust in our treasures, more than what we trust in our government, more than what we trust in our families or people around us. But Lord, that we would put you above all and that we would follow you. That we'd seek out your word and your will that we might be able to be your servants. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of you who are standing, you may be seated for just a moment. We're going to close in in, in just a moment. Those of you who prayed to receive Christ as Savior and to begin to follow uh, Christ uh, in your life, uh, on your communication card, your connection card, there's a line there just under where your personal information is. uh, You can check the box that says, I have chosen or decided to follow Jesus today. If you would check that, bring the card to me. I'm going to be over here at the side door and I'll give you a Bible. Then we also have other materials that we're going to send to you during the week. And we also have groups that will help you to learn how to live the Christian life and to grow in Christ. And so I would encourage you to do that. Everyone else can put their connection card in the tithing offering boxes at this door and also at the exit, just to the left of the exit, out through the Connection Center. Also, I want to point out to you something that is in the uh, worship folder. There are two cards like this. If you would pull those out. These are called invite cards. And they're given to you so that you can invite others. Isn't that kind of neat how that works out? And uh, we're going to be starting a new Saturday night service that we're calling Fusion. That's just about four weeks away now. And uh, on the other side, it says, I love my church. It has changed my life. That's why I'm inviting you. And it has the service times for...
both of our weekend services, the Saturday evening service as well as the Sunday morning service. And so you can invite people to come. If, if you are going to be coming to the Saturday evening service, you can invite people to come along with you. If you're, if you're going to continue to come Sunday morning, but you know people maybe that work Sundays or they have other things going on Sundays and you'd like to invite them Saturday night, you can use this. Or, you know, we have lots of empty chairs, especially in the summer right now with people away. Um, there'll, be, there'll be plenty of room for you to bring your friends to church. So use them on, for Sunday morning and tell them at 10.15 we start and we'd like to invite you to come uh, along on Sunday morning with us at, at 10.15 a.m. So you have two of them. I hope all of you have t- two friends, okay? And uh, that you'll take them and that you will use them. And before we go, I just want to pray just a quick blessing over you as you take these cards to share with others. Lord, we thank you for each one that's here this morning. And Lord, I pray that as, they, as the people of this church take these cards and use them as a tool for inviting, that it will be effective, and that you would help them, dear Lord, to share the enthusiasm that they have for their church and that they would bring others, uh, whether it's Saturday night or Sunday morning, two opportunities for people to come. And our, our desire is that we would be connecting people to Jesus, that we'd be able to reach more and more people for Jesus. May you be glorified, we pray, and may these seeds that we're sowing in these cards bring a harvest of souls for you. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.